uh, although I'll walk through some bundles later. So, uh, my name is Dustin Whittle. You can find out more about me at DustinWhittle.com or follow me on Twitter at Dustin Whittle. Uh, my current role is as a developer evangelist at a company called AppDynamics that does application performance monitoring. Um, I work with a lot of uh, high-scale projects and usually I come in as a performance engineer consulting on best practices. Previous to that, I worked as a consultant and trainer at Sensio Labs in the US, consulting on Symphony 2 projects and training teams on Symphony 2 and Doctrine 2. And then previous to that, I brought Symphony to Yahoo in 2006 to rebuild Delicious and Yahoo Answers, and I've been involved with the Symphony community for now about eight years. Less so uh, more frequent, uh, recently. So how many of you know that Facebook, Yahoo, Zynga, Tumblr, Etsy, and Wikipedia all started on PHP? And most of them still are. But uh, the real question is, why does performance matter? So I know I'm talking to a room full of engineers and care less about the business stuff, but I think it's really important to highlight the impact that performance has on businesses' revenue and really on the, the user experience for your users. So Mozilla shaved 2.2 seconds off their landing page experience. Firefox downloads increased 15.4%. So they got 60 million more downloads simply because the page was a little bit faster. But the best metric that I've come across is that when Amazon and Walmart decrease their end user latency by 100 milliseconds, they increase their revenue through their e-commerce shops by 1%. Uh, so the reality is for a billion dollar billion, a multi-billion dollar company, 1% really matters. And all because the page is slightly faster. The reality is that every tech company treats performance as a feature. So it's really important to realize Amazon, AOL, Yahoo, Shopzilla, Mozilla, they all treat performance uh, not as an afterthought, but as a crucial feature that they plan for. But the reality is that they realize that performance directly impacts their bottom line. All right, but the question is how fast is fast enough? So one second, point 0.1 seconds or 100 milliseconds feels instantaneous. It feels like you're flipping a page in a book. It's very easy to keep your train of thought. After three seconds, users start to lose their train of thought, and after 10 seconds, users abandon the site altogether. And I think everyone in this room can relate to that because they've had an e-commerce experience where they've gone to checkout and they click the checkout button and they wait 10 seconds. And you start to question, okay, is this working or not? Now, the engineers in us all know that you don't click that button a bunch more times, you just wait it out. Okay, so sadly, uh, PHP is slower than Java, C++, Erlang, Go, Node, and a bunch of other languages, but the reality is PHP is not your problem. How many of you are familiar with phpsadness.com? All right, so basically PHP has a bunch of quirks and the community is well aware of them and there's a de uh, dedicated website to point out the quirkiness of PHP. So the point with that is that PHP does have some design issues and inconsistencies, but the reality is that PHP is never going to be your bottleneck. Uh, it's rarely going to be your bottleneck because you can scale PHP for high traffic applications. So let's talk about some ways that you can very easily do that. So again, PHP is not your problem. So many times I walk into a project and they say, hey, we should just rewrite this in Java. Um, that's usually a horrible idea. Right. Okay, so by show of hands, um, how do you run version PHP 5.5 or above? 5.4 and below? Anyone still on 5.3? <laughs> All right, so if you're on 5.3 or 5.4, it's really time to upgrade your environment to 2014. It's almost 2015 now. And uh, what I found is that PHP, FPM, and Nginx is the ideal combination. Uh, I think it works very well. So if you're still running Apache and mod PHP, you can probably get better control over um, how you tune your performance by switching to Nginx and PHP, FPM. So a lot of these are basic tips, so we'll start basic and go to more advanced. So if you're not using an opcode cache, then you'd be surprised how many people don't have APC or Zend op cache. Uh, installed by default. The easiest performance improvement that you can make is just by installing an off cache. PHP uh, interprets the request every uh, single HTTP request, sorry, it interprets your code and converts it to off codes every single request. By installing an opcode cache, that'll only happen in the first request, and from that point forward, it'll serve from the opcode cache. And if you have PHP 5.5, you already have this. So uh, PHP 5.5 has end off cache by default, so a lot of these people have no excuse anymore. But if not, and you're running something older, it's very easy to install APC, simple peckle install APC. All right, I know I'm going a little fast, so I'll try to slow it down based on some Twitter comments. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so 
This is a little bit more debatable. This isn't really necessarily about performance, but it's about developer friendliness and developer um, productivity. So you should use auto-loading and uh, follow the PSR zero spec. If you're using Composer, you're likely already doing this. So if you're not familiar with auto-loading, which is a room full of Symphony 2 developers, I think everyone in here is familiar. Uh, the idea is that instead of using require, require once, include once, uh, you can simply define a class map and look up the classes automatically when you need them. So you can auto-load classes. In Symphony 2, if you have an existing PHP project and you're not using Symphony 2, there's a Symphony 2 component that makes it extremely easy to drop in a class loader and add auto-loading into any existing PHP project. All right, so how many of you have uh, an application that's more than one server? So most people here have a real application which probably has a bunch of PHP nodes sitting behind some load balancer. And the first thing you'll learn is that PHP is really easy to scale beyond a single server. The first issue that you're going to encounter is how do I move sessions? So by default in PHP, you need to optimize your sessions because the default in PHP is to store your sessions on disk. As soon as you add another machine, uh, it's hard to maintain state across the machines, so you need a distributed session store. So, pretty basic. Um, it's better to store your sessions in a database. But that's not an ideal solution because uh, that also has its own problems. So what I found is a couple of uh, better alternatives. So I think the best approach that people uh, generally use is the first attempt is to store your sessions in a database and front it with a shared cache like memcache or Redis. That way I can reduce the read, uh, <clears throat> I can reduce the read request by going to the cache and I only have to touch the database when I update uh, the session or add new data to the session. This is extremely easy to do in PHP. Again, you can pet install memcached, change some settings in your PHP INI and you can get a lot of mileage out of just this. So, uh, I'm going to fast forward through some of these. If you want to download the slides, you can go to speakerdeck.com slash Dustin Whittle. And the slides are available and they come with a lot of notes that include exactly how to implement each one of the things that I'm talking about. Now, what you'll see is that companies like Yahoo and companies of great scale, even working in a database, uh, even storing sessions in a database is extremely expensive for them. So a better solution, and the best solution that I found in PHP, is to limit your session size and store as much data as you can in an encrypted or signed cookie. Now the downside of this is that cookies have a size limit. So if you go over 4K, the browser will no longer process the cookie, depending on the browser, and you'll lose the session state. So you need to be conscious of what data you put in there. Now what you need to store in a se inside the session is as uh, little amount of data as possible. So it's usually just a way to validate the user uh, and maybe some basic access controls. Everything else you can go to the database and read at runtime when you need the information. And I think this is the approach that most large scale applications use. And it's relatively easy to do. There's a bunch of bundles that implement this and by default it's really, really easy to get scale out of more than one machine. So that's the first thing you need to do to get PHP across more than a single machine. Now by a show of hands, how many of you have uh, leveraged an in-memory data cache already? Like memcache or maybe Redis? So you should learn to cache your data, and when you design, you, uh, look at your access patterns, you should understand how you can cache as a part of that. So any data that is expensive to generate or query and long-lived should be cached. So common examples of this are web service responses, HTTP responses if you're using an HTTP cache, database result sets, I think everyone in here has probably used Doctrine, and you probably use memcache or Redis caching inside of the Doctrine ORM, um, and then configuration data that can be expensive to generate. The idea here is that if it's not uh, changing that often, you should cache as much data as possible, and this is just to alleviate the load on your database backends or on your third-party web services. So in some cases, web services rate limit you, so you have to cache it in order to be able to access the data in real time. Um, and in other cases, it's just performance benefit. So how many of you have used Guzzle before? Guzzle HTTP client? So Guzzle is an HTTP client that allows you to interact with web services. But what's nice about Guzzle is it includes a caching layer that will respect HTTP caching headers and allow you to store the web service responses automatically in memcache and it will respect HTTP caching headers. So you don't have to manage the cache state. You can simply install a Guzzle bundle, configure the caching, and then interact with your web services as you, as you normally would. So this is not really a Symphony 2 friendly version of the code because there is a bundle that abstracts all this for you, but if you're just adding it to a PHP project, it's relatively straightforward to configure. The idea here is I instantiate a memcache instance, I instantiate um, a memcache wrapper that's provided by Docker, and I pass it into the Guzzle HTTP client. The important piece to note here is that I register the cache plugin, 
And the first request, I'm going to call wikipedia.org. It's going to make the HTTP request and return the response. And if I immediately call that request again, it's going to return the response from the cache. Relatively straightforward. <coughs> so everyone in here uh, has probably used Doctrine. By a show of hands, Doctrine users. Just because I'm curious, Propel users. All right. That's progress, folks. All right, so Doctrine is an RM for PHP, uh, but one of the better features that it has is uh, caching support. So it has built-in caching support for uh, memcache and Redis that makes it very easy to uh, cache database result sets. So again, this is a, if you're just adding it to a strict PHP project, but it's relatively easy to use otherwise. So you're probably all familiar with the Doctrine Entity Manager. So this is all the bootstrap to get to an Entity Manager. And then you can simply create a query and set to use result set cache uh, to true and give it a time to live. So in this case, I'm going to cache this database result, which is selecting all the users for 60 seconds. And the next time I make that request will be serve from memcache and not go to MySQL directly or whatever your database backend is. So these are all about alleviating load on your uh, third-party services. So on your database, on third-party web services, etc. Now, this one's really about performance and scalability. So the idea here is that you should always do blocking work in the background via task and queues. And there's a ton of different approaches and how to do this. I'm going to talk about the simplest one that I found called Rescue. So the idea here is twofold. One, that you decrease the end user latency because you're not blocking their requests to do things that take a long time. But more importantly, you get increased scalability because if you're adding workers in the background, you can just scale out more workers to get increased throughput. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So again, there's a ton of different tools that you can use to do this. I'm going to talk about Rescue today. Uh, Gearman is a much more powerful job server. RabbitMQ is a great messaging layer. It can be used for a lot of other things. Uh, there's Kafka, VStockD, ZeroMQ, ActiveMQ. There's a ton more as well. Now, let's talk about Rescue. The reason I talk about Rescue is it's just the easiest to explain. So it's not necessarily that I recommend this over the others, but if you're new to queuing and managing tasks in the background, this is a really easy way to get started. So Rescue is a port of a uh, uh, something Chris Bolton wrote for uh, Ruby. Sorry, uh, somebody wrote this for Ruby, and then it was then ported to PHP. But the idea is that any process that is slow and not important for the immediate HTTP response should be queued and done in the background. And sometimes when you have data that is important for the immediate, uh, the next request, you should just block and wait for it. And other times, if it's really long lived, you should put it in the background. So common examples of this are sending notifications to social networks, like Facebook and Twitter. Um, any analytics or instrumentation, if you're doing manual tracking, you want to just fire it off and forget about it. You don't want to block the user's request. And then updating profiles and discovering friends from social accounts. So that's fine if you have a Facebook user and a Facebook user only has 100 connections. But if you have a Facebook user who has 2,000 or 5,000 connections, all of a sudden you're going to have to wait a lot longer. And then in some cases, when you're consuming web services, um, you have to process them fast, or the web service will kill off the connection. So a common example of this is Twitter's streaming API. With Twitter's streaming API, if you don't process the request fast enough, it'll kill off the connection. So you can't do that much work as the responses are coming in. You need to process it in the background. So this is really easy to do. And let's talk about a common use case for this. So I've stolen almost all of these examples off the internet. Uh, from people much smarter than myself. So the references are all in the notes and the slides. So a common use case is the user submits a form. I need to update the database. I maybe need to invalidate memcache. I might need to send an email, post a notification to Facebook and Twitter. And maybe a uh, location's change, and I want to recommend some data based on this new location. So each one of these things is pretty fast. So talking to the database takes 200 milliseconds, and validating the cache is 100 milliseconds, sending an email might be 700 milliseconds. The idea here is that each one is relatively fast. The problem is the aggregate's really slow. So the user has to wait 3.7 seconds for all this stuff to happen. But this isn't all necessary to happen in real time before I serve the next page. So oftentimes, I can put a lot of this in the background. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here, I, the only thing I have to do for the next request is update the database. Some state change, or uh, I need to add an order, and I need to process that in the background. So I can send an order and create an order task. 
which will allow you to create a bunch of workers in the background. In this case, I want to refresh the cache in the background, send some emails, create some notifications, and then recommend some new, uh, recommend some friends based on a new location. In this case, we just cut down the uh, latency, the end user latency, by 3.4 seconds. So now the user is only waiting 300 milliseconds instead of waiting 3.7 seconds. And the idea here is that and instead of making the user wait for all these tasks to finish, I should only make them wait for the things that I have to for the next request. Everything else can be done in the background. So this is the benefit of being able to uh, decrease the end user latency because we're not blocking for as long as we have to. The second benefit, again, is scalability. If I have hundreds of thousands of new orders being created, I can just add more workers in the background to process each one of these tasks faster. So we'll get into that in a bit. So you're probably familiar with the NBC model, given this is a bunch of Symphony 2 users. So we have a controller and an action. And inside of our action, we might be calling some methods, do this, do that. So send an email, post notifications, use some service to do something. When you add caching, or when you add queuing, rather, um, all you need to do is enqueue the results. So I need to create a task for the background. So very simply, what was me calling a bunch of different methods inside of my action, I can move to rescue and simply pass the data to be queued later. So I can create tasks for each one of these items. So in this case, it's as simple as calling rescue and queue, um, and then the task that you want to run. So I might enqueue an email and pass in an array of data for the email that I want to send. I might post a social notification and pass in the array of data for that notification. So relatively straightforward here. Um, just to break this down very simply, uh, rescue, the way it works is it's backed by Redis. So all I need to do to bootstrap it is call rescue set backend, and all I'm doing that is setting a Redis endpoint. And then I need to create my set of tasks. So these tasks are very simple. The only thing rescue cares about is being able to call a perform method. So if you're looking at this as an interface, the only thing that it implements is a method called perform. And then I can have whatever logic that I want in there. So in this case, uh, it's a relatively straightforward example. We just have a class, my tasks, that has one method called perform, and we're going to do some logic in that method. Now when I want to use that inside of my actions, I can simply call rescue and queue my task with some set of data. In this case, I just want to pass in a name, appd, and do something with that. Now in order to actually process this, so you would add the rescue and queue into your actions, you would define each one of the tasks, you completely encapsulate that in a standalone task, and you can name as many as you want. Um, and then all you need to do is spawn workers in the background. So we we'll use PHP from a command line to run workers. In this case, I want to process all of the queues, and I want to create five workers to run five concurrent PHP processes in parallel, and process uh, each item out of the queue. Any questions so far? Sort of ran through that at record speed. All right. So this is a, so we've covered some basic things, like how do you cache web service responses, how do you cache database result sets, and then how do you move work to the background uh, so that you can decrease user latency and that you can increase throughput by adding more PHP workers. So those tips alone will get you pretty far when it comes to scaling PHP applications. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about, which hopefully everyone here has already read the HTTP caching spec, by a show of hands. Nobody? All right. I feel like a few of you are lying. Loaded question. The HTTP caching spec is a long convoluted document that uh, was written five or ten years ago. But the basic idea is that when you have a large distributed application, you have a load balancer. Um, I might have a reverse proxy cache, it's like Varnish or Nginx proxy cache. I have my application nodes, so these are a bunch of PHP services. I might have some a data store that I'm working with, like Memcat, uh, MongoDB, or Redis. And then I have some PHP workers. So you can add as many reverse proxy caches as you want, you can add as many app servers as you need, and you can scale out as many worker nodes to uh, meet demand. But the idea here is that you should leverage caching so that you can alleviate load on the application server. Oftentimes, the, your web pages don't change uh, that often, so you can cache the entire result. If you're using Symfony 2, HTTP caching really couldn't be any easier. So let's take a look at how HTTP caching works and the different strategies that you can employ. So this is a standard HTTP request and response. So Alice shows up and goes to slash welcome. It goes to the cache, there's nothing in the cache. So you go to the back end, you generate your response. In this case, I'm just gonna generate hello world, return that with an HTTP status code of 200 and return that to the client. With no caching, that's basically HTTP request and response. Everyone in here should be familiar with that. 
Now, there's two strategies that you should be familiar with when it comes to HTTP caching. There's expires and invalidation. So you're probably already familiar with HTTP expires because a common best practice for serving JavaScript and CSS is to use a far future expires header so that the browser is only downloaded once. But the same can apply to your servers when you're serving PHP or any other code. So let's talk about expiration. Relatively straightforward. This content expires at this time. Do not ask the server for this content until that time passes. Right? So let's walk through that workflow. Alice comes along and requests slash welcome. There's nothing in the cache, so we go to the PHP server and we request slash welcome. It generates low world response, but this time it includes a max H header. And the max H header is just going to say that this content is good for 600 seconds. So here, where the PHP server is going to return it to the front end cache, reverse proxy cache like Varnish or Nginx, and that's going to return it to Alice, but this time it's going to include a cache control header that includes max age of 600 seconds. Now Bob comes along and requests slash welcome. It goes to the cache. Because Bob only came along 30 seconds later, this response lives in the cache, so I'm going to skip the request to the back end altogether. So I've just alleviated a single HTTP request on my back end server. It's going to return it from the cache. This time it's going to have a cache control of max age 600 with an age of 30 seconds because Bob showed up 30 seconds later, etc. So that's expires caching. Relatively straightforward. Do not contact the server until this time passes. Now that's really great when you know that things aren't going to change or that you don't care that things change. So you might cache your homepage for one minute always, no matter what. Or you might cache some sections of your homepage for one minute. Like top 10 headlines probably doesn't need to be updated um, every single request. So you can very easily cache that for a minute. But oftentimes you need to validate if the cache is still fresh because something could have changed. So in a case where you have a blog, somebody could have shown up and added a comment. So I want to validate that the cache is still valid. So in this example, Alice comes along and requests slash welcome. Goes to the cache. There's nothing in the cache. So we go to the back end. We generate a low world response. But this time we include a last modified header and an e tag. So the last modified header, all it does is tell you when you generated this response. When was the data last modified? And the e tag is simply a unique ID for this resource at this time. So it's a representation of a unique resource. If this was a blog post, I might do something like MD5, the blog post ID, and the number of comments, or the last time a comment was added, and then I have a unique ID for this resource. And then we're going to return the response to Alice from the cache with the last modified header and this e-tag that we've generated. Now Bob comes along a few minutes later, requests slash welcome. And what you'll notice here is that we're always going to make an additional request to the backend server because we still need to validate the content. And the idea when you're using the, the validation cache strategy is that the, it's cheaper to validate that the content is still valid than to generate the page again. Right? So you're still going to go to the backend server, but hopefully what you're doing on the backend server is a lot lighter weight than generating the page from scratch. So again, Bob goes to slash welcome, it's in the cache. The cache talks to the backend server and says, hey, this hasn't been modified since this date, or if none matched, so if no e tag matches this e tag, then return a response. Now this ends with either a 200 response of new content, but more often than not, it'll return a HTTP 304 not modified. So this content hasn't been changed since the last time you requested it. Again, the idea with this strategy is simply that you it's a lot lighter weight to just validate an MD5 tag or a last updated at date than it is to generate the new page all over again, make the request to the database, maybe a third party service, and glue together all of the views. So you, you've alleviated load on the back end. Now there's sometimes where you need to mix both strategies. So I want to only ever talk to the server if this date's passed, but once the date's passed, I don't necessarily need to generate a new response. <laughs> I just need to confirm the, the one that I'm serving is still valid. So you can combine both strategies. So what that looks like is Alice comes along and requests slash welcome. Goes to the cache, nothing exists, so the cache goes to the backend server, your PHP server, and requests the page slash welcome. Returns a hello world. This time it has a cache control with a max age of 60 seconds, and it also includes a last modified date. And then we return it to the client. So Bob comes along and requests slash welcome 30 seconds later because the cache is still valid because we said it expires uh, <clears throat> a max age of 60 seconds and Bob came along 30 seconds later, we're going to serve it directly from the cache. 
So we're going to skip the request to the back end altogether. And then we just return 200 response with cache control header max age and uh, max age of 60 seconds and an age of 30 seconds with the last modified date. Now, Carol comes along and requests slash welcome again, but she comes along uh, two minutes later, so the expires cache is uh, invalid. It's expired at, at this point. So we still need to do the same in the validation workflow. So we're going to the cache because the time's expired. We're going to go back to the back end and we're going to ask the PHP server, can I get a new version of this resource? Here's the last modified date. So all you're going to confirm is either the last modified date has uh, passed and you can refresh the cache by specifying a new max age header, um, or you generate a completely new response if the cache has changed. All of these are, basic, are simple ways to alleviate load on the application server. So it's not about making it faster, uh, it's just about getting more throughput by decreasing uh, the amount of load that you send through uh, the actual application server versus your, your cache, which there's a bunch of different things we'll walk through here. Uh, so we return a response to Carol with a cache, cache control max age of 60 seconds and a last modified timestamp. So in this case, we actually didn't generate a new HT response. We simply refreshed the current cache. So Symphony 2 HTTP Foundation component includes HTTP caching. So I'm pretty sure everyone here is familiar with this. The HTTP Foundation component abstracts the HTTP protocol. So it gives you a way to manage requests, responses, and part of that is managing HTTP caching headers. So you can use this in any application, uh, that's any PHP application. You can either drop in the HTTP foundation component <coughs> independently, like the Drupal project does, um, or you can simply use um, the component directly in your PHP code. So in this case, we're just generating an HTTP response. So everyone probably is familiar with this. You return a new response uh, in every view in Symphony for the most part and you can call set cache, and you can specify the caching headers. So in this case, you just want to set an e tag and a last modify date, it's relatively easy to do, or you can set a max age. So I've listed all the options, you generally don't use all of these, like public and private at the same time, um, but that's the basic idea. So uh, the next thing is when you actually have to process the request, a lot of the times actually validating the, the cache control headers and when you need to process them. So an easy way to do that is uh, through the HTTP Foundation component, it abstracts this a little bit. So you can call is not modified and pass in the, the last request, and it'll validate whether you need to do something with that, like generate a new HTTP response. In this case, I'm just going to take the same response and send it along if it's still valid. So there's a bunch of different reverse proxy servers that make this relatively easy to do. So I think the most popular and probably the most powerful, most performance is Varnish. Um, I highly recommend Varnish, even if you don't use caching everywhere else, I would throw a Varnish instance in front of uh, your PHP nodes just to get increased perform increased scalability. With that said, there's also Squid, there's Nginx, and Apache. So um, with the Nginx, you can use the proxy cache module. I found that using the Nginx proxy cache module with a memcache backend is really uh, is very performance. Um, and then you can do the same thing with Apache if you want but Varnish is definitely the way to go. So you use Varnish as a reverse proxy cache to alleviate load on your application servers. And when you're generating your HTTP responses and your, your actions, you should think about how can they be cached. So it's the same thing when you design a data store, you need to think thoroughly through the data access patterns. Um, you should do the same thing with your controllers. Like, can you cache the home page? Can I cache the top 10 headlines, components, okay. et cetera? Wow, really went through this in record time. So. Optimize your framework. I can't tell you how many projects that I've walked into where they have all the default settings turned on, they're using, um, they're not using internationalization and they're not using security, but they're, those pieces are turned on. So it doesn't matter which framework you're using, they pretty much all have some settings for performance. So here are some basic best practices. So stay up to date with the latest stable version of your framework. Disable features you're not using. So most often this is internationalization and security. Especially in full stack frameworks like Symphony 2, they try to make everything as easy as possible by default, so it means they turn on a lot of the features, whether you need them or not. Um, always use a data cache like Memcache or Redis, so you can enable caching features for views and database result sets. In Symphony 2 projects, this is as easy as going into your config.yml and uh, enabling the Memcache adapter for doctoring. And then when you're actually executing statements, you can just use the result set cache and specify a time to live like we did earlier. And then always use a HTTP cache like Varnish. Relatively straightforward. 
So these are some basic principles when you're designing an application, you're writing your code that you should employ. So try to do as much work as you can in the background, try to catch as much data as possible, and bring through your data access pattern so that you can catch as many of your HTTP responses. But oftentimes it's not, uh, it's the actual code that you're using that's slow, so you should learn how to profile the code for performance. So there's a bunch of different tools that you can use to do that. So a popular combination is xDebug and WebGrind, or xDebug and kcache grind. So xDebug is a profiler for PHP, and WebGrind is a front end for viewing those profiles. So the downside to using xDebug is it's extremely slow, so you're not gonna want it in production. But xDebug is great because it's going to provide all the information you need. WebGrind is a really simple UI that makes it easy to figure out where are you calling the most, uh, where are the most method invocations or method calls, um, and which ones are taking the longest. So if you want something a bit more powerful, there's Kcache Grind, um, but it requires Linux and a X11 setup. Um, but this you can drop onto any PHP project and start profiling right away. So what, it, what you do is you simply install xdebug extension, pack will install xdebug, and then turn on the xdebug profiles, xdebug profiler. So for every request, it'll generate a profile, and then you can view those profiles on WebGrind. And the idea here is to figure out where is my code slow? How much time am I spending in the controller versus how much time am I spending on third-party services? And then for each method call, which are the slowest method calls, and how many times am I calling these methods? So oftentimes what you'll see is you're doing something in a loop, and hey, I call this method 5,000 times every request, hey, we could do something smarter. So this is just a very quick and dirty way to be able to understand what's actually happening in your PHP code. So before you go switching to another language, you should just figure out are there simple things that you can fix inside your application. So this is great in a dev environment, but oftentimes uh, problems don't manifest themselves until you get to a production environment, or until you have a lot of traffic or a lot of concurrency. So you need to be able to monitor production traffic as well. So Facebook and Paul Reinheimer re uh, released XHProf and XHProf QE, which you can use in production, so there's less overhead. Um, and there's been a bunch of uh, projects that have recently spun off of XHProf that we'll talk about. Uh, but the idea here is that if I can run this in production and get a larger sample size and be able to understand in the production environment, where am I spending time? So what are the top method calls? What are the slowest method calls? So you can start to profile from there. There's blackfire.io, which was formerly the Sensio Labs profiler. This is, uh, I believe this was based off of XHProf. Is there any Sensio Labs people in the room? All right, so it was originally based off of XHProf, and it's basically a way to do uh, production monitoring for performance. So I've stolen this directly out of the screencast, so uh, the basic idea is simply that you can map out all your method calls and how they interact with each other. Uh, and then it's low overhead, so you can actually run it in a production environment. Now, with all of these projects, you're basically going to be installing a PHP extension and running some form of an agent. So, I think uh, the profiler is still free, is that correct? In the short term? No? Anybody? Anyway, so check it out, uh, blackfire.io. The idea here is simply that you should monitor production performance so that you understand where your performance bottlenecks are. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. So blackfire.io is one. Um, Kwafu, I believe, is another one that was just released. Uh, and then the company that I work for does something similar. But uh, I'm not really here to talk about my company. I'm here to really talk about uh, monitoring performance and understanding where performance bottlenecks are at. So there's a bunch of different solutions that we can talk about. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with New Relic. Uh, there's a couple of CompuWare, and then there's AppDynamics. The idea here is that you need an instrument both your dev and production environments to understand where your performance bottlenecks are at. Generally what the tools do is they map out your application dependencies, any services that you're working on, tell you what, uh, how much time you're spending on the end, in the browser, and then they'll tell you when you're having performance problems where they actually are. So it's not necessarily using my tool, but you should use some tools so that you can understand the performance of your applications. By a show of hands, how many of you uh, would call yourselves professional developers and work for a reputable web company? Like three in this room? Five? All right. You're getting lazy now? I got it. <laughs> so the idea here, uh, the next question I'd like to ask is how many of you understand how fast your application is in production right now? How many of you find out about a problem because a user complains? Well, yeah, they're usually very hesitant to raise their hands. The reality is that I find that most uh, developers, they don't do that at all. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Like you can use uh, Etsy provides StatsD, and you can manually instrument your code and plug that into Graphite and Grafana to come up with sexy dashboards, or you can use some sort of APM tool. Either way, you should be monitoring production performance somehow. 
So oftentimes what I find is that PHP works best as glue. And what I mean by that is you use a bunch of third-party services and you just use PHP to build out your views. So uh, Yahoo, they had, um, when we built Delicious, the Delicious backend is actually written in C++ and the Yahoo Answers backend is actually written in Java. What we use PHP and Symfony for is to glue together all the web service responses and to serve a cached view. Uh, well, to serve a view that can be cached. What I've noticed recently is uh, a lot of people are training towards writing REST APIs in something like PHP, and then doing all the view <coughs> work in Backbone.js, Ember, Angular, whatever your preference is. So the idea here is that you're shifting the work to the client side. So when you're doing that, how, how do you use PHP? So at Yahoo, when you're writing uh, for billions of users, you need to think about performance from a whole different perspective. And oftentimes what we did is, so uh, Rasmus joined Yahoo early on and wrote something called YPHP, which is a fork of the regular PHP with a bunch of Yahoo extensions. The idea behind the Yahoo extensions is that you can move slow code. If it's too slow, if you're processing large data sets and you need to do things asynchronously, um, you can probably write it faster in C++. You can always write it faster in C++. It's just a lot more engineering effort. So if something's extremely slow in PHP, um, and native PHP code, you can move it to C and expose it as an extension. So oftentimes at Yahoo, that's what they did. So serving ads, dealing with user security, dealing with internationalization, for the most part is provided by extensions. And that's because it's very slow to do in PHP. Now, the problem with that is often uh, C, C development is not in a PHP developer's uh, portfolio, so you need to really think about what engineering resources you have. Most of the tips that I talked about earlier will get you a long way before you need to do this. But before you consider switching to an entire new language, profile your code and figure out that there's just a small piece that you can move to an extension. So I think you can see how this in the Symfony community by using the Twig extension. Some of the Twig parsing is quite slow in PHP, so you move, Derek Rebens wrote a Twig extension for Sensio Labs, and you get some performance benefit from that. So you can very easily install that and start to see um, how that can be applied to the open source community. So even people like Sensio Labs have realized that this is a successful approach. But it's expensive because you need specialized talent for that. So Facebook released HHVM. Well, originally Facebook released HipHop, which was essentially a PHP to C++ converter. Uh, and then they wrote Hack and HHVM, which is essentially a new VM for people that supports PHP and really a JIT. Um, you really tr should not move to HHVM uh, right now. Uh, it's relatively new and it's not, well it's not as well supported as it could be, but Facebook is investing heavily. So the idea behind using HHVM as a drop-in replacement for PHP is that you get a lot more benefit from this because it's a lot more optimized. So comparing that, hopefully this person's in the room, maybe not, uh, but the idea is that you can see that you can get great performance improvements uh, simply by changing the interpreter that you're using. So the HHVM is a completely new approach. It's actually built for hack the language by Facebook. Uh, that also supports PHP. The problem with that is that it's not complete, so it might not support all the extensions that you're using, it might not support the frameworks that you're using, but Facebook as a company has invested heavily um, by in trying to add support for these frameworks and all the extensions so it's available for the general PHP community and it's not just solving Facebook's purpose. So long before you try to switch to Java or C++, see if you can't just change the interpreter to improve your performance. All right, so just to recap, Upgrade to PHP 5.5, use an opcode cache of some kind. Stay up to date with your framework and dependencies. It's really easy to do if you're using Composer. Optimize your session store and move to sign cookies if you can, or if you can't do that, then move to a database fronted by a cache. Cache all of your database and web service access in something like uh, Memcache or Redis. Do blocking work in the background with queues and tasks. And use HTTP caching to alleviate load on your servers. And then figure out where your performance bottlenecks are by using xdebug in your dev environment and running profiles and running xhprof in production so you can understand uh, exactly where you're having problems. So don't forget to optimize the client side. I know I'm talking to a room full of PHP developers, but I think that a lot of people don't realize in modern web applications, you spend more time on the client side than you do on the server side. The, 100 milliseconds you're waiting for PHP is nothing compared to the two seconds you're waiting in the browser for JavaScript and CSS to download, for the DOM to build, and for the browser to paint the page and to become usable. So PHP makes that really easy to do with libraries like Aesthetic. So you should use Aesthetic to optimize your client-side assets. So 
it's relatively easy to do. Common best practices for managing front-end assets are, um, actually, let me back up a little bit. Use Bower to manage your uh, front-end dependencies. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Bower, it's basically Composer for JavaScript, uh, which is quite convenient. Um, and then you can use something like Gulp or uh, the other one that I can't remember, because uh, I don't want to use it, um, to basically manage client-side tasks. But in PHP, it's relatively easy to optimize your CSS and JavaScript. Like, I want to concatenate it, and then I want to minify it, and I want to serve a cached version of this off a of CDN. A set it can help you manage that from PHP directly. And then there's Google PageSpeed. So Google PageSpeed is an uh, API that allows you to analyze and optimize the client-side performance of your applications and give you practical tips for how to improve it. So you can take the advice from Google PageSpeed and you can implement that advice using a set. One of the things that I like about Google PageSpeed is that it's available via a website, it's available via Chrome extension, and more importantly, it's available via an API so that you can integrate it into your uh, continuous integration workflow and get a performance report every time you commit, which is really useful to understand how performance changes over time. Yeah, really want to break your time. But the scalability is really about the entire architecture. It's not about minor code optimizations. And I think a lot of people argue about single quotes versus double quotes and other uh, insane arguments, which make no sense. Honestly, most of the time, is going to, you're going to get a lot more performance out of things like using caching and moving work to the background. Um, all of that stuff is fixed by the interpreter anyways when it gets converted to opcodes. So don't argue about it. And yeah, I think I went a little too fast for you guys. but. Uh, Questions? <laughs> and I said I would slow down today. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, any questions at all? It's not all ask at once. Good. Varnish, the Nginx uh, with the Nginx proxy cache backed by the men cache is a useful combination. Varnish will be faster. In my experience, Varnish is going to be the, uh, the fastest reverse proxy cache, um, but it depends on how it's set up. Yeah. Um, Nginx, so I oftentimes, Varnish can be a pain to configure correctly and to set up a large deployment with. So it's easier just to turn on, like in my dev environment, the Nginx proxy cache module um, and use that as a reverse proxy. Because you can literally just go into Nginx, enable the proxy cache module, and you're done. So maybe you specify a men cache backend. Um, and really the idea here is that it doesn't matter, uh, well, it shouldn't matter what you put uh, in the Varnish layer here. Uh, as long as you have a reverse proxy cache, you're going to alleviate load on the application server itself. Any other questions? Yeah, so absolutely. I think that um, you have to understand the data access patterns when you implement <coughs> caching on any layer. So I do think that you uh, should use caching for your database result sets and any web services in addition to view caching, served by something like Varnish or Nginx. Um, what you're talking about is, hey, I'm serving something stable from a cache, and maybe I... Uh, generally, what I find is when you have that problem, that you set the cache time to live too long, or you're not invalidating the cache when you update it, on the server side. Um, it's not necessarily because you're using view caching and database results at caching that you automatically have that problem. It's usually that you didn't think through how both interact together. Um, but I, I definitely recommend both, yeah. Any other questions? All right, yeah. Would you always recommend having varnish on first level after load balancer in terms of connection handling instead of in terms of scalability instead of having Nginx? So sometimes, uh, so in this case, this is using Amazon vernacular, like an ELB is an elastic load balancer provided by Amazon Web Services. Um, it depends. Sometimes if I'm using like an F5 hardware load balancer, I might put um, something like Hot Proxy behind it and have Hot Proxy talk to 
um, Nginx directly. Um, it depends on the setup, but generally yeah, I always recommend putting uh, between your load balancer and your application server a reverse proxy cache. Yes. <coughs> So, yes, it's possible. Usually, it's a bad idea. Is how I look at that. So, what usually what you should be doing is, uh, if you're using Varnish, Varnish supports edge side includes. And what you really want to do is not cache the entire page, or maybe I only cache the entire page, but I have certain sections that can change dynamically that I include uh, via edge side includes. So that way I can serve most of the page from the cache directly, and I can update the dynamic regions by talking to the application server for just that piece. So if I have a home page that has top 10 headlines, and the top 10 headlines, I want to refresh every 30 seconds, but I want to cache the rest of the page for 60 seconds, I can just include that component with an ESI include tag. So the way that works in Symphony 2 projects is when you uh, call render, you can pass uh, standalone true, I believe that's still correct. Uh, and what that'll do is when it uh, outputs the file, it'll include an ESI for the, that template that you're trying to render. And when Varnish interprets that, it's going to interpret the rest of the page as a cache, and it's going to talk to the application server for just that segment, and it's going to glue that piece together as a pro proxy cache layer. And I think that's often um, a much better solution than just trying to pull what was out of the cache and figure out which piece I should uh, go and uh, rewrite. Uh, so that's yeah, the answer, I think. Any other questions? All right, so sorry I went a little too fast uh, yet again, but you can find all these slides on speakerdeck.com slash Dustin Whittle. Uh, if I can answer any questions or be of any help, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Thank you very much for joining, and please do leave any feedback. Thank you.